Welcome everybody to the Route to Ready Unlock Your Digital Transformation Journey. I am Kevin Berger and I am your host and I am the CEO of Incubator in the US. Before we get started, there's three things. This will be an hour. We will be recording it and please ask your questions through the chat. We have three brilliant presenters today. Matthew Kelleher from Google, who's head of digital marketing transformation, the Americas, and Jessica Jacobs, who's Incubator's chief client officer, and Haley Forbes, who's VP of marketing and online experience at American Public Education. So what is digital transformation and why should I care? All of you have seen this before, and some of you know what it is, some of you don't know what it is, but today we're going to find out how to get the most out of it. And with that, I'm going to introduce Matthew. Um, so I met Matthew in the late in the um, in late 2014, working on an education brand. He came in, um, Haley as well, uh, and really enjoyed everything he said. He, um, he comes from Ralph Lauren, lives, loves data, and how to get the most out of it. Matthew. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Kevin. Um, hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Uh, it's lunchtime for us on the East Coast. Um, I'm based in New York. I'm working from home. Because um, I'm working from home and you never know. Did I come in okay? I just got a notice. So. All's good. All's good. You never, like, as soon as you go on stage. Um, I've been at Google for nine years. Thank you, Kevin. Before that, I was at Ralph Lauren. Um, I used to run marketing, digital marketing, and ad tech and martech for Ralph Lauren. So I was on client side. Um, but the last nine years, I've been at Google on the solutions team. Um, Kevin and I worked together on a few different clients before on analytics and attribution. Um, the last three of those nine years, I've been helping bring our transformation program to market. Um, I helped create it internally, and I've also helped launch it externally, bringing it to clients and customers such as yourself. Um, and today I've got 10 minutes with you, uh, 10, 15 minutes, um, before I hand it over to Jessica. So I've got three topics I want to hit. And the first is meeting the moment and really setting up the context for the session today. And then diving into Google's route to ready, which is really helping navigate uncertainty and all the disruption going on with three clear steps to what we're calling modern marketing. And then three great case studies to hopefully share and inspire. So we go forward, hopefully I'm not gonna lose, great, okay, good. Uh, so kicking off, um, we're opening up with meeting the modern day consumer, right? There's so much change going on in the world. Um, there's three quick data points that I thought lead off today with anchoring us, provide some context about what's going on in the world and also setting us up for what modern marketing actually means. So let's go into the first one. And from an e-commerce point of view, you know, this, this uh, speaks to me since I got into e-commerce literally in 2000, 1999, 2000. Um, we're finally here at the trillion dollar mark. So it took 22 years to make a trillion dollars, which is humongous. That's a massive milestone. And it was accelerated. This is not news to all of you, right? Through the pandemic, all of us shopped online. You know, we focused working from home online. Everything became digital. So the transition to digital was massive, 20, 30% lifts in growth. Um, and post pandemic, this stat is basically saying, look, even though we're coming out of it, shoppers are still shopping with the same frequency right? In fact, even higher than before the pandemic. So this is a lot of incremental shopping and it's a lot of opportunity for all of us as marketers to advertise and get in front of our customers digitally, even more than before. The second stat is around personalization. So you would think everything going on with privacy, Scarlett's going to give you the next slide. You know, consumers today, and this stat is very recent, they still want privacy, they still want personalization. They still want their advertising to speak to them. They want their personalized interactions. They want their emails, their, their ad campaigns, everything uh, personalized to them when they hand over their information to you and build a relationship with you. They want customers' ex experiences um, that drive and speak to them, um, and they expect it. Now, at the same time, if you go to the next slide, this is also in line with their privacy demands as seeing privacy as a basic human right. This is a big movement across the whole globe, right? Their right is that privacy is to be respected. That as marketers, nine out of 10 adults believe that marketers who have access can only do so with permission. You cannot have my information if I didn't give it to you. 
It is a basic fundamental right. And look, fraud protection is here to stay. This, this number surprised me. 85% of internet users today have some sort of precautions online to protect their information. This is literally leaning into fraud protection. So these modern day consumers, thank you, Scarlett, for changing the slide. Here we are. There's basically a lot of reaction happening against this, this change, both technology and the government. And this is not news to all of you. This is front and center for all of us as marketers, figuring out how to lean into this change. What am I gonna do when third-party cookies go away? How do I navigate cross-site tracking limitations that are now in, 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 our, in our campaigns and our measurement? Um, and how are these regulatory changes forcing my team to change how we collect and protect our data for our customers? This is happening across the globe, and this is where we have to meet the moment. All of us, we have to ask ourselves, are these changes happening to us or really for us? And that's kind of a nice segue to one of our quotes from our friend Seth Godin, who is, uh, he wrote this quote of, you know, it's not about catching up to the status quo. It's really about inventing the status quo. And that's kind of the mindset that all of us right now in 2020, as we look to 2023, in our careers right here, right now, we have to figure out what is our current marketing plan and roadmap, our tech roadmap, especially. What are we doing in terms of digital marketing? We have the ability to flex and change quickly. That's what digital marketing has given us. How can we change our media? How can we look at our tech? How can we make sure that we're, we're looking at the wave of innovation in front of us to make sure we learn quickly and plan innovation so we can actually invent the status quo? So at the end of the day, yep, the one more slide, thank you. you know, this is tough because as we look at Q4, there's a reality check. And I think, I think you know, we had two rough years of COVID disrupting global supply chains and it led into a war and rising prices and inflation. It's, it's a little rough out there. We're all going through it. Um, and I think, you know, if you go to the next slide, it really, it's, it's, it's uncertainty creates opportunity, right? Where there are places where you can lean in to figure out, okay, stay focused, stay aggressive, even with pullbacks, how can I look at where I'm innovating and where I'm not and then sort of cut things that aren't working and lean into things that can set up my future. So as the economy rebounds and everything comes back into, you know, a lift from the market, how can you dive in and grab advantages, you know, that everything's in place to grab the pent up demand. So uncertainty is opportunity. Now at Google, we're well positioned to help all of you navigate uncertainty and to drive innovation. Innovation is core to who we are. We are machine learning pioneers, and we have a commitment to social and ethical responsibility. There's a tremendous amount of brain power at Google, our sellers, our specialists, our partners like Incubata. We're all here to help guide our clients on the best practices for digital marketing to get through these times. So with that context, let's set up and shift the conversation about how we do this. How do we connect and meet the moment? What are those three steps? How can we help action you for Q4 in 2023? So I've had the fortune and opportunity to lead this transformation program here at Google since we launched it in 2019, right before the pandemic. Um, back in 2019, we worked with BCG to identify what are the four phases of the best marketers uh, and, and driving their marketing maturity. You can see here on the right, there's four stages of digital marketing maturity, with the lowest as a nascent marketer with very low maturity. And as we've seen up, uh, marketers grow and advance their capabilities, they go up and to the right as an advanced digital marketer that used modern capabilities to power all their customer journeys. Now, earlier you saw Kevin uh, feature one of our tools. Our program offers best practices and tools to help all of you assess where you are in your journey and what you can do to advance yourselves. Now, with privacy and all the shifts in the last two and a half, three years, we've been updating this framework to navigate things like privacy and keep things moving along based on all the changes that are happening. And earlier this year, we refocused our North Star on modern marketing and what it takes very simply to get there. Marketers must embrace data and technology to meet these needs of the modern consumer. Upping, sorry, advancing capabilities up and to the right is what we're after today. And we're gonna talk about the three steps to get there. You can go to the next slide. So this is where we say that, you know, navigating the shift in the industry, this is a huge opportunity. Right, everything in digital advertising is changing and we're at a crossroads. So disruption is happening, but opportunity is converging. And this is where we need an evolutionary change. What are the three things I can do? 
We're pivoting away from third-party cookies. Mobile IDs are changing. If we turn it on its head, it's a huge opportunity. And this is the setup for all the decades of marketing to come. There's three things we can do is number one, connect our data more and differently than ever before. Innovate and think bigger than we've ever needed to before. And experiment using all the time we have now, especially while third party cookies still work to find out what works and what doesn't work against our first party data. It is our belief that the future of marketing and measurement is consented first party modeled and augmented data. And we're going to get into what that exactly means. Let's go through the first connect. So the first step of becoming modern marketing in today's times is connect. Connecting more data and using it differently is the cornerstone and foundation of the next gen marketing, measurement and activation. Connect is basically what it says. Connect your data sources. Connect your customer data, your media, your analytics, bring it all together, ensure that you're capturing it correctly and you're acting against all the things you have access to. We want you to break down the silos, both your data, your internal teams, and bring together agencies and partners to make sure everyone's in lockstep and in sync to all your shared goals and your data sets. This connectivity allows you to get the best use of all your first party data, which is the most valuable thing to your company that you own and control. And this lets you get to know your customers who have opted in, bought your products, used your services, and they want to engage with you. In return, you give them a thoughtful customer experience and you give them strong marketing across all the touch points to show them some love. You then use this data to find more customers like that and you can test out all new channels like connected TV or digital out of home, all new channels to, to tap into with your first party data. You need to have, make sure that the first party data strategy is actually in place and executing and you have the best infrastructure to leverage. Now, investing in this sets up the foundation for all the technologies that you get to layer in when you activate and innovate this data, like modeling, machine learning, automation. Let's lean into what those things are. But before we do, let's actually have some actions here that you can take away to your team based on these three steps. So let's take a minute to reflect back for connect. Go back to your team and think, hey, what times of first party data do we have access to? More importantly, how are we using it? Are we using it for insights? Wonderful, that's amazing. Are we using it to action our media? Did we bring it to search? Did we bring it to display? Did we bring it to video? All this data can be brought into all the channels. What teams are you working with to bring all that data together? Analytics, CRM, agencies and partners. All these questions are things that you have to think about for Q4 into 2023. For example, if you had first party data for your lifetime value of your customers, are you bringing that in to drive holiday for this year? How can you speak to your clients and all your, your most valuable customers leveraging that data in display and media and search? We go to the next slide. Innovate, this is the second step. So modern marketing, you've heard it probably 10 times from me already today. Modern marketing demands innovation. This is a new time. Disruption and all this you know, accelerating technology means we have to innovate and learn fast. Um, meeting the moment, this is about embracing new technologies and new data strategies every day, day to day. And a lot of this comes from incorporating all these data signals, new data signals, and moving past the status quo. The biggest shift and the takeaway here is we're asking you to lean into the combination effect of first party data and machine learning. So marketers who are navigating all these changes successfully are really embracing machine learning to capture growth from the new signals they incorporate. Customers today, right now, are using first party data and machine learning to drive acquisition, retention, upsell and cross sell. And they do this by ingesting the data, creating predictive models, and leveraging key features in platforms such as the Google marketing platform, like optimized targeting and value-based bidding. Leaning into these solutions and these predictive models and machine learning, it's the combination effect that gives you speed and efficiency, it gives you time back to work on other things like tech roadmaps to continue to um, innovate. So as you think about an action takeaway, we invite you to take a moment and think, am I leveraging predictive? or machine learning signals in my strategies today? If you haven't, have the conversation with your team. Adjust your tech roadmaps and all of your activation and your media channels to look at how your first party data is coming together and integrating across everything. 
Look at search and display and video. Are you using it across all three? Do you use it across all lines of business? You want to ensure you can have scale and performance across everything and leverage everywhere. And the last is experiment. Now, it's funny, the third leg of modern marketing is experimentation. I get looks from customers all the time with a blank stare. What are you talking about? Why are you talking about experiments? That doesn't sound very cool. Actually, experimentation is cool. And the best marketers experiment every day, all day, all the time. These are the learnings that we found in coordination with BCG. These are things we see in the trenches every day. Incubator is there to help you. Experimentation literally shows how to do things differently at scale. You test, you learn, you iterate. You bring it to the market. You bring it to all the different channels. You can learn different bidding strategies quickly, creative formats, new targets and target expansions. Experimentation is a tried and true practice. And the best marketers set everything up as a testing mentality so that their culture can shift and have a fail fast, learn quick. And agile, you know, this is not something recently invented. It's what we're all leaning into because it works. Right now, we also have the luxury of time with third-party cookies still in place. That gives you a good A-B test. As you lean into first-party data, you can contrast it to the third-party uh, methods that will go away. So the time for testing is now. So thank you, uh, Scarlett. The number one question to take away how comfortable are you and your organization in testing? Do you have it set up to have a ex learning agenda, an experimentation plan? Are you ad hoc? Are you reactive? Are you proactive? You know, are you really open to test and learn with your targeting, your creative, your bidding? What is the structure for that plan? When's the last time you tested a new feature? Was it rough? Was it easy? You know, you have to figure out with your culture, where's your culture today to help shift it? How do you create a safety, you know, a safety with a, a feeling of safety to fail fast uh, and to share learnings across the organization? You know, it's, it's this how we see clients really approaching new solutions and innovation, and it takes all the action to try something new. So in summary, modern marketers really should prioritize three pillars right now, Q4 into 2023. Connect your data, break down those silos and get first party data. It is the most important thing you can do across all your channels. And that takes innovation. It means bringing it in, doing great analyses like predictive models, lifetime value calculations, and bringing it in to test things, test that against all your media channels and show the lift. Let's actually take a look at some of the case studies for lift to three people who have done this before. And the first is actually from Incubata, which is an amazing um, uh, skincare client. They were looking to leverage their first party data into display. And you can see here, they actually follow the one, two, three framework, which we love, connect, innovate, and experiment. So first they connected their first party data together. In this case, analytics. Analytics was their primary source. They built a predictive model and it leveraged machine learning to predict purchase propensity and lifetime value of a customer. They then took this, ingested it into the media platform and activated it and they activated against first party audience segments that, that launched huge improvements. They actually did it through an experiment too, which is the trifecta. And so in that experiment to show versus A versus B, you can see the 5X ROAS improvement, 86% decrease in CPA and a huge increase in media spend. Those are huge wins. The second example is around a global sportswear client, very similar one, two, three approach. In this case, this client took their data to create a new approach to modern measurement, what we're calling modern measurement, which is really attribution, but cookie-less attribution. What is cookie-less attribution? That's bringing your data together, still modeling it, and actually making sure that you can see all the different touch points, but through privacy-safe, responsible first-party data. They did that model, the cookie-less attribution model. They brought the insights back into the media and they, did it, they took the insights and um, compared it through an experiment against their legacy last touch model, and they unlocked 60 million potential incremental e-commerce sales. They actually had an extra 5% increase when they brought another signal in from their consumer credit cards and actually helped lift their machine learning techniques with another signal. This is an example of great modern measurement. And the last one, a consumer electronic client, consumer, lex, bleh, <laughs> consumer electronics client, I can't even speak today. Um, they also looked at their first party data. And in this case, they took a lot of GA data, um, the event level site signals, 
and they had figured out which signals actually could help predict their offline sales. So they used online data to help predict offline. When they leveraged all this, they brought it into their bid strategy. They ingested it to the media platforms to inform bidding, and they saw a 50% lift in all the high value actions in their funnel. They also saw a 60% lift in the purchase drivers versus the baseline. These are three examples of what we call the one-two punch with an experiment. You connect the data, you activate it, and you have an experiment to show lift. These are the best practices of being modern. This is what everyone's leaning into now, and we want you to do the same. Jessica, I'm gonna hand it to you to learn more about uh, Incubator's approach. Yeah, perfect, thank you so much. Sure. So um, kind of slotting in on what Matthew said, which were absolutely brilliant results. And of course, this is really what advertisers want to lean to. But the question is, what are the steps that you actually have to take to get to what is now known as this mature environment that we are in? And everybody kind of refers to a digital transformation framework or a roadmap, but it actually takes a lot. So leading or, or leaning back to, to the quote mentioned, so by, by Seth Godin, it's chasing the status quo. Um, the problem is today, uh, the digital transformation requirement is quite a heavy one because we're everyday students with the acceleration of digital. And that means that whilst we are a little bit in a chasing phase, we can get to the point where we're actually absolutely kind of leading the solutions that are out there. So my focus and what I want to share is actually telling you, what do you have to do as an organization? What are some of the steps that you have to consider? Or if you are joining us to kind of understand what you can take to some of your clients, I will be sharing some useful tips that you can put into place. Now, in the absence of a digital transformation framework, you will not be able to actually acquire a lot of these new customers. So one of the most pivotal points, I think, and Matthew landed it so well, is we are moving into an era where it is critical for us to understand the characteristics of our consumers. But we have to do it in such a way where we're not invading their privacy and we're asking them to give them a lot more of the experiences that we once had before. Next to this, we want to be able to reach the same clientele. Um, we cannot by any means go back into the kind of spray and pray technique where we're saying, you know what, I'm not going to segment my audiences again. I'm just going to go ahead and target everyone. It just will not work because a few years ago, when most of us still considered this to be a working strategy, there was a lot less adverts in the ecosystem. Today, it is a cluttered space and it is quite easy for ads to get lost or feel zero connection to the end consumer. So we really need to make sure that we continue to push in tailoring the experiences back to consumers. But now the ball is in our court. We have to work somewhat harder what to what we did before in order to reach them. And that's actually okay because we sit with a vast amount of data that we've been collecting for years. And all we now need to do is find smart techniques to utilize the data. Then looking at understanding it. Now, one of the most trending topics that we all probably have heard is machine learning and slot that even or, or one step further and we're talking AI. Now, we are aware of how to kind of review historic data, but we now need to be a little bit smart in terms of how we act by building a lot of the models for the future. But this change actually requires quite a significant effort. So now we have to actually ask ourselves the really hard question. Everybody knows this. Where should the change happen? Now, one of the biggest blockers when you take change into an organization is the, the resistance that you're going to get from it. The thing is, it's easy to say that we need to kind of piece all of these things together. When you're in digital, you have that mindset and you immediately tell yourself that you know the data, media and creative all belong in the same world. But historically, organizations are not set up that way. This means there is an element of change that we have to prepare for. So the first question I often get when I'm working with large organizations and driving some of this change across digital maturity is, where does change actually happen? Do you apply it to the team? Do you make sure that your team has the necessary knowledge to actually drive a lot of these new maturities forward? Or is it just purely technologies? 
Do you start looking at smart machine learning technologies or methods that you're going to build into all of the data you own today to actually drive this forward? And the answer is a lot simpler when you start breaking it down into manageable moments. The answer lies in between that. You have to design a way of working on both sides. There is an element where people will remain a pivotal part in driving your digital maturity forward. And then there is an absolute element where you're going to utilize today's technologies to bring success in your organization. But this is easier said than done. So to ensure that change is essentially painful or, or not painful, I would say, um, when you look at the method that has been presented by Google, it's a simple understanding. There's first two steps that you take, and then there's an absolute benefit to doing so. That is probably the key message in this, is when you break down the steps that you need to take in the organization in simpler moments, similar to how you would do with consumers, but you start internally first. So what we have done, and this is an example of what we would essentially also utilize for our clients, is creating a very clear picture of success. And in this picture of success, there needs to be benefits every single step of the way. Now, this can vastly dif differ, especially if you're thinking about multiple products, multiple brands, perhaps in an organization, or even multiple markets. Then you need to consider that there's going to be a very level of, of knowledge, different technologies being utilized, and perhaps even in that ecosystem as well, different partners. So you need to get an overview first of what are the different levels that is existing in your organization today. And this can easily be achieved through a simple survey that helps you pre-allocate certain uh, divisions, certain products, or certain service lines into a category. What we have done is we have defined three core levels in driving change. So when we look at digital maturity, and please break this down into what you're looking to mature first as well. It is sometimes, of course, a lot more rewarding when you throw everything in at it. But sometimes you even have to go back down to the foundational things. There's maturity in technology, there's maturity in media, in data, and in creative. They all have to take their own step in this. Ultimately, you'll be able to achieve complete success when you get all of them to the same level. So in our case, we've got identified a disordered level, a reactive one, a proactive, and a value-driven one. And these levels, each of them will have clear benefits. The benefits are the negative points that you turn around. The ones that are not meeting standard today will ultimately be the benefits that they will unlock. And in this framework, when we work with clients, we'll say, if you're gonna split this by markets, give markets a goal in which level you're expecting for them to achieve. Do not try and push everybody at the same time to the ultimate value level, which in our case would be level four, because they will be immediately resistant to it. They need to understand the time, the effort that's going to go into this in order for them to take these steps. Because this will slot in on top of their day-to-day -day activities, just, just to ensure that they keep the performance for business as usual in place. When I break down the criteria, um, this is now an example of how you could apply this essentially to everything in an organization. I, I would actually give them clear bullet points of what are the identifiers that I'm expecting to see across the variant levels. So for level one, there would be, for example, no governance. This is a team of people that cannot have don't have perhaps don't have time to build documentation. They do not have time to work on looking back at campaigns and predicting how they should have changed it in the future because next to their day-to-day -day task, they just do not have the knowledge to do so. When we look at the reactive stage or the reactive level of people, there is an effort to try and get a level of governance or best in class set up in place. But because there's just no time or no knowledge to do so, they just will not move to automation. It's not the top priority for them. They're going to stay where they are comfortable. The proactive level are the ones that are willing and have an established gov governance in place. Governance could look at things like naming conventions. They already have a central place where they can find 
a lot of their data because all of their channels, in fact, incorporate the same way of working. They document things, but they do not spend time to review it. This is probably one of the key things that I have run into when working with organizations. Everybody believes that the blueprint or the playbook that they have created a few years ago is still relevant today. But unfortunately, it's not. It requires us to have some sort of a cycle in place that reminds us to review this. And then the ultimate level is where you've got everything fully established. Where this is also a critical part for success, specifically in efficiencies, we look at digital transformation as the first driver for performance, which it absolutely delivers against. But the other driver for efficiency is this helps you in the process to ensure that your onboarding of new staff is much simpler because you have a defined way of working, because it is easy for them to showcase how you have been working and how they should be working. So how we actually do this today, if we kind of break this down into two parts, is we start by preparing a very much future focus approach into driving all of these touch points. And this could be like some of the examples that Matthew mentioned, when we're working with clients, there's clear actions that we're looking to put into place. The second point to that is making sure that for every single change we're looking to drive, we're going to have a level of buy-in with the stakeholders that we will be working with. A key or important part to please take away from this is when you're in this preparation phase, ensure that you're collecting information in a very collaborative way. Ask how everybody is doing it today to better understand what will be the blockers in the future. Make sure that whilst you're actually connecting with them, you're giving them a clear process and a structure that will be followed to actually clean and standardize ways of working. And then following the activation, you take controlling back into your own hands to say that you will be combining a lot of the learnings to make sure that there's one clear way of working. And in that process, there will be, there will be revision and check-in moments as well. Through buy-in, you, you can isolate it uh, in a test case. So identify what is going to be a fast mover that's going to allow everybody to want to take part in this change. Put a team behind it that is isolated and that can move really quickly to pull together a success case for your organization and use that to drive excitement. In this process, build in a, tra a training academy. We absolutely love the idea of always building in what we would refer to as our digital academy as part of driving change across any one of these points. And in this, break it down by different stakeholders. Ensure that you're giving non-technical stakeholders or technical stakeholders the relevant information that will keep them engaged. The most critical part in this will be the communication plan. The communication plan should very clearly illustrate where you're expecting somebody to jump in and how much time you're going to require from them. This is going to ensure that at no point will there ever be pushback to actually drive change because everybody feels comfortable that they understand the clear requirements. We would not be able to share a lot of these tips if we haven't had some of the success ourselves. So to briefly share where we have done large digital maturity frameworks for clients, I will highlight two, two, I will call out two clients specifically in this. So for Perfetti Famala, it was an holistic look at transforming their approach to media and tech. And for L'Oreal, we broke it down and focusing specifically on the personalization pillar, which would look at everything in display creatives um, using dynamic creative, looking at dynamic video and then personalization on site. Starting off with Perfetti, um, to kind of explain also how complex the ecosystem can get, we were, we were asked to help drive this transformation across, across 15 markets. Now, included into this 15 markets, we also have to consider all of the local media agencies that are involved. Immediately kind of bumping up the complexity because now you need to define ways of working for an organization, but you also need to slot in and ensure that existing agencies we're utilizing the new way of working. It started off by showcasing to them where there would be a benefit. So we isolated one market, which was Italy, where we actually were able to run a pilot to test what, what is the ideal setup um, using the Google marketing platform. 
How often should they have done optimization? What was their best buying method to consider? And what was the ideal naming conventions that would slot in with everything else in the organization? Immediately by running this pilot for seven months in Italy, we were able to showcase a significant change in performance by changing simple things in the technologies and simple things in the way of working in media. We packaged it up and we actually held two summits. The summits were split across the US and EMEA with a second summit for the APAC teams, where we introduced to them this new framework that was ultimately going to help give them more media mileage. That was the benefit. We wanted to ensure that we could hook them in to say that if we were going to rethink your tech and we were going to rethink your media, you were going to spend less um, media budgets by getting the same results, enabling them to reinvest that media back into more innovative ways of working. This has been rolled out across all 15 markets. And at the end of a two year program, we were able to actually measure what was the success holistically for this brand? Now, Perfetti Fanmala is known for brands such as Mentos, Smins, Frutella, candy brands that are known across the globe. So if we think about the large volume of spend they have in a year and for, that we were actually able to save them 70% of that by just re-looking and revisiting how they had set up GMP, it is a significant saving. Today, we still continue with a quality assurance layer where we can just do a checkup to ensure that if new marketers are onboarded, that they understand the ways of working and to ensure that the adoption is successful throughout the program. Jumping into L'Oreal, um, everybody I think is very familiar with L'Oreal as a, as a brand globally. Uh, the group itself houses probably some of the most famous or familiar beauty brands worldwide, and we get to work with all of them. But in itself, that is a challenge. For a brand that's got multiple markets, agencies, and different partners involved in the ecosystem with various brands that immediately mean a different brand CI for every single brand, the first thing you're going to look at is how can we bring in automation for creative? We have been partnering with L'Oreal to do exactly that. So we again built in a digital transformation journey that helps us to focus specifically on the personalization pillar by identifying how markets were today activating creative. For most parts, they went back to static. What we wanted to ensure is that they actually moved from static creatives into dynamic creatives. That in itself would have given them a massive saving on two pillars in the organization. Our picture of success was firstly performance and secondly, driving efficiencies in the business. The level of or the variant level of stakeholders that we were dealing with was significant. Not only was the knowledge level at, at different levels, but we also had a lot of different divisions that we were working with. For every single creative component, there would be a local brand team, a global brand team, as well as various media teams that would look at activating different brands. In this case, we immediately ring fenced a training component into this, where we could ensure that all stakeholders had an understanding of the impact that Dynamic Creative will have, followed by an automated workflow. In our automated workflow, we immediately looked at augmenting GMP in a smart way by simplifying the setup and incorporating the Google Manufacture Center where they were already investing a lot of time for product feeds. And we built it back into one single user interface that was easy to use for all marketers. Today, we continue this journey across all of their brands and helping their media agencies launch Dynamic Creative successfully and at the end of this year, the picture of success will be of the, of the markets that we've identified, they would have moved from what would essentially be a nascent execution on creative to a connected execution on creative. Thank you. Handing over to Hayley. All right. Hello, everyone. 
Um, so I am Haley Forbes. Thank you to Matthew and Jess so much. Um, I do have cold and you can probably hear that. So I'm hoping that uh, the, the coughing will hold off for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> you know, of course, all of these talks so far have been complimentary and I have the benefit of going last, of hearing everything um, and touching back on, on some of the things that Matthew and Jess have said. Um, it's all about digital transformation, obviously, but one of the things that I've noticed throughout this talk is you're, you know, you're gonna see that we've each pinpointed these very similar successes that we've had in our own experiences that work and they work no matter the client or the brand. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that you can see some of those similarities across the board and, and you know, it kind of create some of that blueprint or footholds that you need in order to take this back to your brand or your clients in order to, um, <clears throat> to find some of that uh, digital maturity success. So, I, I like to make things fun. So you're going to see some like stupid, kitschy things throughout, throughout this presentation. But this is your digital transformation starter pack, um, complete with a case study as, as the others um, were as well. Um, but, you know, I, I, I want to focus on what my experience has been, um, both at, on the agency side and then also coming over to the brand side. So why me and what's my marketing street cred? So when I was tapped for um, for this uh, talk today, um, <clears throat> you know, by by Kevin, I've I've worked alongside of him for a long time. Um, I spent my last fifteen years across agencies. I have spent the last eighteen years at a global agency, leading the global client management team across enterprise clients. Um, I loved every single minute of it. I worked across a diverse portfolio of clients, across um, education, beauty, entertainment, B two B, all kinds of stuff. I learned a ton. Um, and when I was tapped for this position at API, I wasn't really looking to leave, and nor was it an easy decision. But ultimately, I decided that I wanted to work for a company whose goals that I was trying to achieve. Um, and so I moved to APEI because of the challenge it presented, but also the familiarity and expertise that I had in the industry. So today we're going to talk about how I parlayed that uh, personal experience, the personal career experience that I have in knowledge and digital transformation into my role at APEI. Um, <clears throat> and what we did in you know, five or six years um, at my previous role on the agency side, I want to do in two um, here at APEI. So um, who the hell is APEI? Probably none of you have heard of, have heard of them. And so um, hopefully leaving this, you will have a better idea of who we are. APEI is um, a, a parent organization of five institutions um, and growing. And so um, this is really re to represent the diversity of our portfolio, but also our audiences and how complex, um, you know, the span of our brands um, become once we start to look at the digital maturity across all five of them. So, you know, we've got our fully online universities, AMU and APU. We've got our blended online and campus universities, Rasmussen and Hanjo. So those are fo focused on nursing. We've got AMU focused on military and veterans, APU on the working adult, on first generation. We've got Got GSUSA, who's doing federal government certificate training programs and things like that. So there's all kinds of different audiences that, that we're dealing with within the same organization, and they're all going to be at a different starting point, each one of those brands. But um, they all have, you know, sim they all have, um, you know, they're all five different schools with overlapping, but also distinct audiences. And we have this incredibly um, long and complex prospect user journey in EDU. And so this is from a Google Ipsos study that was done in 2017, um, but still very relevant today. So, you know, we've got the complication of five different brands hundreds of audiences um, within those. And then we have the added complication of just the complexity of our user journey. So that's up to 3,000 different digital touch points. It can be over a year long, years long, in fact. And so all of this adds up to a very complex universe that we're trying to manipulate and transform all at once. Um, but the good news is, is that I've done this before. Um, as I mentioned, I worked across education throughout my 
career. I led one particularly large EDU client um, during my tenure at my last agency. And when I say that I've done this before, I'm saying that because I'm speaking from my perspective, but I would be remiss to say that it wasn't we. Um, there was a huge team behind the success, both on the agency side, on the client side. But one thing that I do want to call out, but was it was it was really a trinity. It was also, um, you know, with our with our platform partners. So with Google um, and you know, we really need to treat Google like a partner and not an enemy. Um, so a lot of us, you know, can I've, I've had many clients on the agency side who are quite cynical about working with Google. And that really does hamper your ability to grow. You're going, it's unavoidable. You're going to be spending money with Google. Let's use their resources. Let's use their subject matter expertise in order to accelerate your digital maturity. Um, so obviously, you know, you guys saw this at the top. This is the BCG Google digital maturity curve. We're all very familiar with this. Um, this is some of the success that we had with um, with our EDU client at my previous agency. So I'm not going to, you know, some of the steps that we're going to walk through following this is that um, that transformation that we went through over, you know, six, eight years, um, moving from nascent where we started edging into multi-moment um, when I when I left the agency um, and what we did in between that. But what I do know is each of those steps that were taken, we we had the results to justify that, right? And so we were able to increase our brand investment as a result of that by four times. We increased our organic um, traffic, our organic leads, the, the students that were coming from organic um, by 75%. We increased our students by 40% um, through all of, these, all of these tactics that we're gonna talk about in just a second. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> there were three, Coming off of the heels of that of that case study, um, you know, was a real it was a real reflection of eight years of, of work that, that we had put into it, that I had put into it. Right. And coming into this new role with new clients or, or brands in, in this case and all at a different starting point, where and what was I going to focus on and where do you start? And there were really three areas that I hit the ground running on and not one was more important than the other. The first one, I'm going to kind of like lump data measurement technology um, just to, you know, still make it a three pointer. Um, but I'm going to kind of lump those all together like triplets. So you need data, you need measurement, you need technology to enable it. Matthew and Jess have all talked through this already, um, but marketing has a really hard ass job, right? You're spending lots of money. People are going to constantly be questioning the efficiency of those dollars. And we need the data that's going to help you justify that, the measurement protocol um, that's going to help you, um, you know, pinpoint those successes and the technology that will help you enable your use of that data and your use of those measurement, um, those measurement tools. And so first up with data, the very first thing that I asked when I walked into APEI is how are we using our first party data? How are we segmenting our first party data? Are we using it just to target audiences? Are we using it to build similar audiences? Are we personalizing messaging and creating and creative to our audience segments? Um, and that can all sound like, you, you know, you're really trying to boil the ocean, especially when we're talking about the number of different audiences, identifying those audiences, which is a whole other task, right? And so while, you know, when I walked into the role, we were leveraging um, our, our CRM data within our optimization platforms, but we weren't really distinguishing it at all. We weren't segmenting those audiences. And so we decided to start small. We want to, you know, we know that there are two very distinct experiences for a prospect who has submitted a lead form uh, but hasn't yet filled out an application versus a prospect who has filled out an application and is on their way to enrollment. This is our highest intent audience. It's our highest impact audience. And one message does not fit all. So while we're using our first party uh, data to uh, our first party audiences to nurture those prospects, we were creating those experiences unique to their place in the journey. So the very first thing we did was start to segment those out, 
We worked across um, uh, creative and product and brand to really identify what were the messaging, what were the FAQs, what were those, um, you know, what were those anxieties that we could help quell within marketing that we could um, further, you know, um, uh, improve that likability of the brand, favorability of the brand, getting the brand back in front of them. What's that nudging strategy, that reminder strategy? So just starting small and just segmenting out those two most important audiences that we have and delivering a unique creative experience to them. Measurement. So we can't rely on one form of measurement. We've talked about that already today, um, and especially not where we're going in this world of privacy. We need multiple forms of measurement, um, unified measurement. You know, we need, we do still leverage last click. I know that that's taboo, but I do think that um, particularly in this long user journey where we're looking at a year out when we've, we do have loss of cookies, um, we do want to leverage last click as kind of that one of those first indications of success, but we also need Need to uh, we need to combine that with our you, you know with um, uh, incrementality testing with MTA or attribution modeling and with um, MMM and so when we're um, you know we need to be able to evaluate all of our performance based on causation, based on actionability, recency, breadth and depth, and the ease of implementation of that measurement model. And there's no measurement model that can do all of those things. And so prior coming on to API, um, you know, we don't have an MMM model, nor will we soon. They're, they're expensive, they're heavy lifts, they take time, you know, they're they're um, in hindsight, you know, they're, they're historically looking. And so we wanted um, something that was going to allow us to have some of the insights that an MMM could provide, an MMM kind of crossed with an MTA could provide um, that would help us inform our 2020 through 2023 budgeting process. And so um, upon coming on, I asked, you know, I asked our team, let's compile the data, let's get it over to Google and let's run a dynamic attribution model with Google. And the team was like, oh no, we don't share that information with Google. And I'm like, Oh, yes, we do. Um, going back to that point, Google is our partner, right? Like allow them to help us. And so we handed over the data. They ran the dynamic attribution model. And it's allowed us to use that in combination with all of our other kind of KPIs, reporting models. We do do a little bit of attribution over here. Um, in combination with each of those in order to create a, uh, a, a testing budget within our 2023 planning so that we can test into those areas where we are under indexing, where the model showed that we are under indexing and shift some of those dollars from where we're um, over indexing into that as well as adding some, some um, incremental investment. Um, and so finally, technology, we needed to connect, you know, we've, we talked about connection, we needed to connect sales and marketing, pull the data from our CRM back into our optimization models so that we can optimize on revenue driving business objectives. The fact that anybody is optimizing on anything other than revenue is baffling. You need to get to the point where you are optimizing to the lowest possible business objective that is tied to revenue. So immediately upon coming on, we brought on SA360. We knew that, you know, it was a partner, it was an enterprise solution that we needed so that we could connect sales or CRM back to our optimization platform in this one, you know, where we were spending the majority of our spend um, back to our optimization platform so that we could actually optimize based on our students rather than just our leads or apps. Um, so as you can see, you know, these are three really big meaty topics, but we're starting with the first of many successive steps that will take to mature across each one of these areas. Um, small steps equals big wins. And I love what Jess said, finding man manageable moments for success. I think that's such a good takeaway here. Um, next up, creative. So everybody remembers content is king, but if I'm going to slap a gender on a subject, it's going to be female. Um, and like most women, creative contributes more than we give it credit for. Um, and so when I first joined, we did a complete audit of our creative. Um, we looked at every funnel stage, at every brand, at all of our goals, our audiences that we had, what messaging was out there, the asset type, the specs, everything. We created a whole big matrix. We said, okay, great. This is what we have. 
What do we need, right? What's the frequency that we need our creative turned over, whether it's evergreen creative or whether it's a test or whether it's this for this specific, you know, whether we have sequential messaging or, um, you know, whether throughout our, our nurture strategy, are we creating different messaging? Are we testing different messaging and things like that? And so it was really important to us that as we built out this matrix, that we worked really closely with our creative partners, with our product marketing partners, with our brand partners, in order to ensure that one, we're aligned on the strategy, two, creative is prepared and has the resources to execute on what we need, because we're going to tell, we're giving them everything, right? We need all of this in order to be successful in 2023. And then it is on them to figure out the resources that they need in order to meet the needs of marketing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's incredibly powerful, I think, to be able to hand over, especially to a creative team, here's what we need for the year. There are no excuses after that. If you're able to hand them your plan for the year, there are no excuses as to why they shouldn't be able to meet those needs, especially if you've worked together on what those needs are and what the resources and the process are to, um, to kind of execute on that. And then within that annual plan, you've got your quarterly testing. So ensuring that you're constantly evaluating the data, analyzing that, and coming up with new ideations and new tests. But also more importantly, I have heard every single creative team that I have ever worked with complain about not getting any feedback from marketing, not knowing what works. And testing allows you to give that information back to them. That's what they want. They want that information so that they can improve their creatives, so that they can learn, so that they know what best practices are, what performs best on what platforms, what performs best for what audiences, et cetera. Um, finally, and we're coming up on time, expand your posse. Um, so don't silo yourself. Don't build up walls in marketing. Yes, you're the best and no one else understands you or what you do and why you get all the money, but you better be in the game of making allies because you're going to need them. And first up, find yourself a project manager. I love project management. Love, love, love. Um, we have about five or six work streams that we've started in the last six, six months across marketing. It's comprised of 25 projects or so. They're from high impact, high, you know, implementation or high effort level, low in, or uh, low implementation level. We're not doing anything with low impact, I suppose, but we've got 25 projects, right? And nobody's going to be able to keep that straight. And that should be under, uh, you know, it should have a centralization to all of this is rolling up to the same strategy within the same team. The same person is managing it. Everybody sort of knows at any given point where these projects are, what the roadblocks are, what might be slowing it down, what the resources are for requiring that. That is the PM's job and allow them to help you facilitate the steps along the way that will mature, that will help you um, uh, with your digital advancement. And, and, you know, you don't have to do all the, the, the organizational work right behind it. Um, and then finally, um, I was at a talk a few years ago with NDG, who was like this famous Googler. I think he's left now and I won't be able to say his last name because it's like French. But anyway, um, he talked about, he, he came and, and talked to us as a, as a client team. And he said that the single most important thing that you can do as marketers is connect with your CFO. So what do finance and marketing have in common with an ox pecker and a zebra? I bet you didn't think that this was going to come up. Mutualism. We both have a mutually beneficial relationship with one another if you give me money, I will make you money. But I have to be able to present that back to you in a way where you see marketing as a revenue driver and not a cost center. That is your job as a marketer to be able to explain that in terms to finance. And you're going to do that through data, through measurement, through those incrementality testing in order to show them that these it is not a last click world, right? It is not linear. All of these things are contributing to the success that you're seeing on the back end. And so actually with, with previous clients, we've actually done attribution roadshows where we've had like continuing education almost with CEOs and CFOs in order to get them to understand really how attributable marketing works and how we're supposed to attribute success across these different channels and, and to marketing as a whole. And so finally, just to sum up, um, you know, 
prove your case, leverage your first party data, unified measurement technology to enable your digital transformation. Creative is queen. Um, creative is 70% of a campaign's performance. We've all heard that stat, stat but it's 100% undervalued. Leverage your creative as your competitive advantage. And then expand your posse. Transformation is all encompassing, requires many work streams, cross-functional teams. Do not work against it. Um, so I'm six months in. I hope uh, a couple of years from now we'll be back here again and I'll be sharing our case study, the APEI case study of our digital transformation and how we got to multi-moment. But uh, thank you all so much and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Haley. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, we are out of time. Um, so we in the blog, we will have um, post some questions and post some responses. Um, but again, really appreciate everyone for dialing in. Really appreciate the speakers um, for um, participating and, and sharing their stories. We have a white paper on tomorrow's world living with first party data. You can scan me for access, uh, although if you can do that quick, I don't know, but certainly when we play this back, you'll have a little more time. With that, again, thank you everybody so much. Have a great day, a great year. Thank you.